Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to be together once Hello. again on this um, Wednesday night. I'm glad you have joined us, whether uh, it's in person or you're joining us for uh, the recording afterward. I'm glad that you are here. Um, let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for these Wednesday nights, for the opportunity to uh, simply pause and to recenter our lives on the truth of your scriptures. Lord, we pray that you would um, send your spirit, um, just um, speak to us through the conversations we will have this night. And tonight, Lord, we talk about the race of faith, and sometimes we know that that can overwhelm us. You call us to finish strong, but so often we just feel so weary. And so help us, teach us to be just like Jesus and to keep our eyes focused on you no matter what life brings. And so guide our conversation, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we're on day 28. I'm sorry. No, we're not. We're on day 27. The heart of the runner. Um, and he begins with um, Hebrews 12. I'm on page 140 in the book, by the way. Hebrews 12 says, let us run the race that is before us and never give up. So tonight's um, devotion is a little longer than normal. So I'll just try to uh, summarize it as best I can. He talks about um, the image of running that we find within uh, the Bible. Um, he says the word race is from the Greek agon, which is where we get the word agony, right? Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. Uh, amen. Yes. It says the Christian's race is not a jog, but rather a demanding and grueling, sometimes agonizing race. It takes a massive effort to finish strong. <laughs> Likely you've noticed that many don't finish. Surely you've observed there are many on the side of the trail. They used to be running. There was a time when they kept the pace, but the weariness set in. And then a little further down, it says, by contrast, our master, Jesus, is the classic example of one who endured. And then he talked about, goes on on page 141 uh, about all the temptations that uh, Jesus faced, um, specifically the temptation, uh, the 40 day temptation in the wilderness. Um, he talks about that. Um, and then toward the bottom of page 141, he says, Jesus could have quit the race, but he didn't. He kept on running. And then on to page 142, says, imagine what it would be like to run the race and be criticized by the bystanders. So he's helping us um, try to imagine Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. We know the story. There's three temptations, specific temptations. But um, indeed, uh, the story says that he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, imagine trying to run the race as he brings out here. And um, there's no one cheering you on. Uh, but there's all the people uh, just criticizing you. Um, belittling you, he says. Um, and then he talks about running this 5K, right? And the only way he made it was by the encouragement of the people standing on the sidelines, um, bolstering uh, him on. Then he asks the questions, what if in the toughest steps of the race, I had heard words of accusation and not encouragement? And he goes on to argue on the bottom of page 142 that that's what happened to Jesus. You know, his own family called him a lunatic. His neighbors treated him even worse. When Jesus returned to his hometown, they tried to throw him off a cliff. Um, but he goes on to say, accusations didn't defeat Jesus, nor did the shame dishearten him. Then he quotes Hebrews 12. Jesus accepted the shame as if it were nothing. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's a conversation in and of itself. Then on the last page of 144, so he asked the question, how? You know, how did Jesus endure such disgrace? What gave Jesus the strength to endure the shame of the entire world? It says, like Jesus, we are tempted. Like Jesus, we are accused. Like Jesus, we are ashamed. But unlike Jesus, we give up. We give out. We sit down. How can we keep running as Jesus did? How can our hearts have the endurance that Jesus had? Um, 
ultimately by focusing on where Jesus focused, and that is the joy that God put before him. Um, so next, uh, next week, we're going to actually talk about um, Jesus' approach to this, um, but tonight we're simply going to uh, contemplate on what um, Jesus faced. Um, so the first question here, it says, which of Jesus' obstacles and resistance did you find resonating in some way with your own experiences in life? So um, of all of these um, temptations that Jesus faced uh, that Max brings out, which ones most <laughs> resonated with you and maybe why that is? How does it resonate with your own experience in life? Welcome, Linda, by the way. I'm glad you made it. Oh, hi, Linda. Late, but... We're glad you're here. So, yes, Peg. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I don't know if this answers the question, but I know I would have had a hard time uh, not letting that rock be turned into a loaf of bread if I was really hungry. And Jesus was really hungry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, the devil knew how to push all the buttons, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's uh, when you're um, when you're starving and you're famished, uh, and you know that you could uh, turn the rock into bread. You know that's um, that's quite personal, right? Um, right. Quite tempting, indeed. Yes. Anyone else? Yes, Jim. I think for me it was uh, being offered all the kingdoms of the world uh, in my uh, youth. Uh, I, I always went after the big bucks instead of uh, what I should have been looking at. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think we can all relate to that in some way. So, Yes, Carol. Well, I didn't have anything specific, but I was thinking in terms of Jesus knew what the ending was for him. And yet he went ahead and did it anyway. And when we face or when I face obstacles, I don't know. I know what the end the end is going to be, but I don't know what the end here in this life is. And so um, it's not as easy. I don't, I don't say it's easy for him, but it's so many questions that are unanswered. Yes, yes. I know exactly what you mean. So, um, you know, when we're supposed to, as it says to the, keep our eyes fixed on the joy that God, you know, puts before us. A lot of times we don't know what God is putting before us and what that joy mm -hmm. might be. And so, yeah, it's hard to continue on and not to, you know, go off to the sideline and rest or give up. Yeah. I... Good point. Yes, Jim. Yeah. I, I, you know, I may be dating myself, but I remember uh, as a child, you know, on the merry-go-round trying to grab the brass ring and never being able to grab it. Yep. I'm nauseous just thinking about that, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it was I always off the horse a few times. Yeah. It was always fun until it stopped and you had to get off. <laughs> and the world kept spinning. That was never good. So um well, yes, you know, Carol. well, you know, it's not really that funny because actually life is I don't remember the name of that ride at Six Flags that you stuck to the sides, the spindle top, spindle top, where I threw up once and that was the last time I ever rode it. But that's <laughs> kind of how life is. You just keep spinning and spinning and spinning. And when you get off, you just want to throw up because mm -hmm. you don't know what the ending is going to be. Yes. So it's yeah. kind of a good analogy. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, in what ways were you able to identify with the story about running the race and being encouraged by strangers? How can you relate to that? Yes, Linda. This isn't really, and I guess it's running the race of life and everything. <clears throat> but all I could think of was that this was less January or February, whenever everybody was being accused of racism and everything was racist and everything was horrible. And I, who had 
seen racism for the first time at seven years old, knew it was wrong, and it was never a part of me. My great grandmother lived in Watts, and you, you know, she talked about all the people exactly the same, and that's that was kind of what I grew up with. And that was really upsetting me that we were tearing each other apart after trying after what Martin Luther King said, what he said just epitomized what I'd always believed. Then on my morning walk, which I do at 6.30 in the morning, so it's dark at that time, I was walking and this woman stopped her car, rolled down her window and said, are you looking for your dog? And I realized she met, meant a neighbor who had a little dog she walked with. And I said, no, that would be the other lady. And she said, well, uh, I just wanted to make sure. And I said, thank you so much for caring and asking. Well, as far, I kept watching for her. I never saw her again. And within a couple of weeks, I got to thinking of her as my angel because she was black and she stopped she didn't care that I was white. She didn't, she didn't automatically assume I was a racist or anything. And it just, it brought me so much peace to know that not everybody was falling for that. And I saw it again Halloween with all the kids coming through of every single color and everything and how they all interacted and had so much fun Sunday night. Uh, mm -hmm. trunk or treating so but I I still think of her as my angel she was on her way to work at Panera and I keep hoping I can get into Panera Sunday and see if she's still there and thank her because yeah. she gave me a long-lasting lift angels are like that <laughs> yes y years ago oh, I uh, kind of rambled on no yeah that's that's great wonderful story um, years ago, uh, Carrie ran a marathon, um, and with this all being on the race, I asked her what she most remembered, and um, boy, this will preach. I should have her do the, the Bible study tonight. Uh, the two things she remembered was um, the toughest part of the race. Um, you know, a marathon is 26.2 miles, and you would think that the hardest part of the race was, you know, mile 24, 25, and 26 when you just can't anymore, but it's not. It's um, in the mile between, it's different for everyone, but it's in the mile between 19 and 21. Uh, that's not only when you hit your physical wall, but you hit your mental wall as well. Your brain just says, I just, you know, we can't do this anymore. Um, and it's, it's when you're able to persevere through that, that time, then it ultimately gets easier, believe it or not. And the closer you get to the, the finish race, then the, the adrenaline kicks in again, knowing, okay, I'm going to make this, I can do this, and there will be celebration at the end. So, um, that's the first thing. And I mean, just think about that in our race of faith, you know, when we hit that wall, whatever that is for us, and we just, you know, just want to give up, uh, knowing that if we push through that wall, whatever that wall is, the wall of unbelief, the wall of doubt, the wall of whatever it is, uh, if we push through that, ultimately, it will get easier and we will uh, find that joy that is awaiting us at the end of the finish line. Um, that's the first thing she said. And the second thing she said was the other hardest part of the race, uh, she ran this in Austin, was there was a, a, a section that, where they were running where it was a construction zone. So there, was, there weren't any spectators allowed during the, I think it was about a three mile uh, stretch. And she said that was also the hardest part because there was no one cheering them on. There were no stations where you could get water or the, the goo that they eat, you know, to keep going the um, so she said that the fact that there was no one cheering them on, just total strangers, you know, no one cheering them on, that was another uh, difficult part for her. And that, you know, it, talking about being encouraged by strangers, you know, what, what are the people that are encouraging us on, sometimes that we don't even know, like the woman, you know, that stopped and asked, you know, are you okay, that total stranger. Um, I think that's um, worth thinking about. And then to think about how are we encouraging other people, even complete strangers, you know, on in their, um, not only in their walk of faith, but in their life, you know, how are we finding ways to uh, encourage others? Um, because complete strangers can be um, huge, you know, to keep us going, whether we realize it or not. So um, any of the thoughts that come to mind?
So let's uh, let's go on to the. Oh, I'm sorry, Marsha. Please. Well, I was going to say they're not exactly strangers, but I had a lot of encouragement from professors and instructors and mentors when I was in college, and especially um, one particular woman who was always in my corner and just really encouraged me. Yes. And that can make a world of difference, right? It did. Um, yes. Um, I remember, you know, especially through um, college, all of my um, theology mentors, um, you know, I think a lot of people think that when you decide to become a pastor, that it's just, you know, it's just a one one way ticket and you just, you know, do what you have to do and you thrive the whole time. But there's lots of questioning and doubt. There's all these roller coaster rides. And there's those times when you're just like, I, I just, you know, not only do I not think I want to do this anymore, but I don't think I can. And so you need those people uh, to say, I know, you know, we've all been there before, but um, this is just a, a single moment of doubt rather than, um, you know, God telling you this is not what your calling is. So we, we need those people in our life to, to help us walk through and to give us perspective indeed. So yes, Lorene. Well, I really don't know if this makes sense, but when I think about the saints, the people that were before me, the family or people that persevered in the Bible before me, and I was thinking of like my grandmother and my aunt that just passed away, and I feel like they're still cheering me on, even though they're not here. Yes, yes, which is perfect. Into the we're going to move into the um, passage from Hebrews twelve. That's exactly what this text assures us, Lorraine. So, do I have a um, volunteer to read on page one forty-five? I'll read. Okay. I won't, be, I won't be here next week, so somebody else can read. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Marcia. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with the perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Marcia. So the reflecting questions are what phrase is in this passage make the strongest impression on you in reading the verse, these verses together? Um, so what image in here really sticks out for you? Yes, Carol. Um, perfecter of our faith. From um, you may or may not know, I'm a very independent person, <laughs> and so um, it's a, a perfect reminder that I can't do everything alone. And at times, when quit laughing, whenever like I feel really low, I remind myself that God only wants what's best for us, and that He promised He would be there, and then things seem to be okay. Yeah. And notice um, Jesus, it says the author and perfecter of our faith. That means that God not only gives us that faith, but he perfects it as well. So that means we are the recipients, you know, it's all gift. You know, we preached, I preached on this on reformation. It's all gift. Um, so it's not something that we have to muster up. So, you know, when we say, I just, I just don't feel like I have enough faith. The, the answer to that question is you always have enough faith because it is a gift you know, God has already planted that deep within you. You just have to trust uh, that, you know, the author and the perfecter of that faith that somehow, some way, um, you know, it will come to fruition the way it is. So, um, yeah, the, uh, um, Lorena, your, your comment made me think of, you know, where it says we are surrounded by such a, a cloud of witnesses. I always think of Emma's uh, confirmation day. And when we laid hands on her, um, you know, my parents were there on that day and I couldn't help but see um, in that moment that, um, you know, that my parents passed the faith on to me and now I have passed my faith on to, to Emma Grace. And um, I couldn't help but see behind my parents, 
um, their parents, you know, my, my, um, my grandparents who are no longer living and their parents and the parents behind them, you know, so I, I saw this huge circle all of a sudden of all the people who have come before us, um, all part of that blessing of immigrants where um, it's the passing on of faith. Um, and I think that's a, you know, we all have those people, whether it's family members or uh, pastors mm -hmm. or um, friends, you know, whatever it is, whoever it was, maybe Sunday school teachers as a, as a kid, whoever that was that passed on the faith to you, someone in their life passed on the faith to them. So we can just trace that back. Um, so ultimately we are um, surrounded by this, you know, this great cloud of, of witnesses. Um, and I think that's a very powerful image. So it's not just about me, you know, but it's all these people who have come before us. So yes, Marsha. When you talk about Emma Grace that way, many of you here tonight won't be able to really appreciate this, but we prayed and prayed and prayed for Emma Grace. And Lois at that time was sending out the messages <laughs> by email. And you know what I'm going to say, Lois? Yes. She sent out the email that said, Emma Grace is ours. <laughs> and that, that just meant everything to our congregation. Yes. We'd had yes. a few days of really, really um, not knowing which way things were going to go and lots of prayers going up that they would go the way we wanted them to. And then when she sent the email out, she didn't say Emma Grace is Theirs. Pastor Craig's yes. and Carrie. She said Emma Grace is ours. And yes. I think that's how we all have felt about her. Yes, yeah. the cloud of witnesses, <laughs> yes. Has picked on that one. <laughs> yes. I remember that too, Lois. We talked about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was nice. Yeah. And it gives new meaning, I think, to the whole family of God and, you know, the brothers and sisters in Christ um, that, you know, we are not, I always say our lives are not our own. And it's not just the calling that God has placed on our lives, but we belong to one another and we're accountable to one another and we're, um, you know, called to support one another. So, um, you know, just this week, you know, with uh, Leo having um, his uh, foot surgery tomorrow, you know, they're asking for some meals to help out. And so, you know, Peg stepped forward and says, you know, I'll organize some people to do meals. And, you know, she just announced before we started that, um, you know, that a week of meals are now uh, going to be uh, taken over to them. So it's, you know, it's this great cloud of witnesses, not only living, I mean, not only dead, but living as well, that we realize that, you know, we are all in this together. And we can't do it by ourselves, you know, somehow, some way we're going to need help along the way. So, and then the final question on page 145 is based on this passage, what do you need to do in order to avoid growing weary and losing heart? Yes, Peg. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Yeah, just, mm -hmm. there it that, is, right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? How do we do that in daily life? Yes, Lorene, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, and when Peg said that, it also reminded me a little earlier when it talks in this about being entangled. And I think that we get entangled that it's so easy to get entangled that there's sin everywhere and we're caught up in it. And we really need to, like Peg said, fix our eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, then we will obey him. Yeah. So it's, it's maybe where our focus is, right? Um, where we put our thoughts, where we put our minds, um, you know, who are we focusing on? So I am. Um, um, you know, it was especially hard when we were in the midst of COVID and everyone was becoming news junkies just to, you know, figure out we had no idea what was coming on, what was coming. And so, you know, a lot of us turned into to news junkies and um, it became to eat away at our souls in a lot of ways. Uh, and so we had to you kind of step back and say, you know what, we, we're not to fix our eyes on the, the evening news or on the, the worst case scenarios, kind of the weird to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the you know, the author and perfecter of our faith. Um, so it's not in order to get through it. It's not us trying to figure out, um, you know, all the answers, but it's to, as always, it's to entrust our lives uh, into God's hands and to trusting that somehow, some way God will, will lead us through this. Um, so 
Did I see another hand earlier? No. Yes, Lois. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the important things, uh, I mean, scripture is good, but knowing that scripture will come into your mind when something's going on in your life. And uh, we might not even realize that we really remembered that, but it does. And then, uh, of course, scripture, but I, th I think prayer, because anywhere you are, you can talk to God. I just can't help but think that that's the main focus that we can have and, and live daily and all day. Yes, yes. You know, the, the hymn comes to mind when <clears throat> you were talking that what a friend we have in Jesus, you know, um, you know, are we heavy laden? Or are, they, are we full of burdens? And, you know, have we taken that to the Lord in prayer? Because he is um, able and willing, you know, to take that from us. So, um yeah so yes carol well and just adding on to what lois said if you think about any successful relationship it's because you have good communication and if you don't communicate with god then it's all one-sided on his part so you have to have constant communication yes yeah and sometimes just being able to say, you know, show me the way, uh, give me a new perspective, you know, whatever the perspective I'm missing out on that I don't understand, you know, grant that to me. That's the, the perfecter of our faith, right? The, the constant working um, through our hearts and our minds. Um, so, yeah, that's. Um, anyone else? Yes. Um, oh, Nola, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, as you know, one of my favorite hymn is in the garden. And in, at the last, it says, then he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. And I think just knowing that he is always there and that he loves us and will do anything for us. Mm -hmm. It's life-changing, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it, um, isn't it marvelous that, um, you know, they call the, the hymns that we sing on Sunday morning, the take home material. Um, it's the, you may, uh, you may not uh, remember anything part of the liturgy. You may not remember a word of my sermon, but um, that hymn, um, you know, it's going to stick with you, not only the lines of the hymn, but it, you're going to be humming it and singing it. You know, if you're like me on a Sunday evening, you just find yourself um, humming and you're all, what is that? And you realize, oh, that's the hymn we sang in, in church on, you know, this morning. So it, it sticks with you. Um, and I, I think that's the, the power of our hymnody, um, that it stays with us and it um, instructs us and it gives us hope as we uh, go about our days. So, um, well, let's close with prayer. Again, Lord, for this time you have given, we give you thanks and praise. And we especially give you thanks, knowing that um, you journey with us in our race of faith. And we know that there are people on the sidelines just uh, encouraging us, and we need that encouragement. And so we give you thanks for those people in our lives who um, just um, encourage us to persevere and to keep the faith um, when the difficult times come. So help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to understand um, what that means and how we can live that out and the difference that it makes in our daily lives. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So thank you all for being here. We will see you again next Wednesday night. God's blessings. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.